I'm Dr. Kenneth Samonte and welcome to another session of K-Explain. So in today's lesson, um, we will be talking about one of the instructional design model applicable for all the teachers and uh, the instructional designers. For many years now, Educators and instructional designers alike have used the ADI model or the ADI instructional design method as a framework in designing and developing their instruction. So what does ADI mean? ADI is an instructional design model that helps instructors, the instructional designers, and training specialists plan and create instruction. The ADI model is used also to create all kinds of instructions from teaching elementary, um, secondary, and college students about different subjects. In this presentation, however, we will use a simple instruction to illustrate the ADI principle. Basically, ADI comes from a simple acronym since it's a five-step instructional method or model. Its name refers to the five stages or five different stages included in the process of creating an instruction. These are analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. So to fully specify how an instructor or the teachers can benefit from the ADI model, so we need to take a look at the five key um, stages it comprises and each stage is accompanied by some tips um, just in case you are wondering how to use the ADI model to develop your own instruction so let's take a closer look at the first space the analysis space doing a thorough analysis before developing and implementing instruction can save a lot of time and resources the analysis space generally consists of four sub-paces, the development of instructional goals, an instructional analysis, a learner analysis, and the development of learning objectives. So let's talk about the instructional goals. The creation of the instructional goals is separate from how the instruction will be carried out. That is to avoid, of course, thinking about your teaching as you are doing this task. Instructional goals are created in response to the needs or to needs. And needs are gaps between the present situation and what can or should be possible. So once you've clearly defined what your instructional goals are, you will be better equipped to develop your instruction. Next is the instructional analysis. During the instructional analysis, a curriculum creator defines and writes out all the necessary steps necessary to carry out the instructional goals. Now, this space is often not simple as it seems because we need to look into the teaching techniques, the methods, the strategies, and tools to carry out the instruction. The next part of the analysis space is the learner analysis. This is when you find out what your learners are already know about the subject at hand. When you have a specific set of learners, for example, um, one student, it is, it's a lot easier to do a learner analysis. Maybe you can ask or talk to him or her personally. But if your learning audience is bigger, let's say for example, 40 students, because the average class size in the Philippines, of course, ranges from 30 to 50, most especially in elementary, secondary, and in college. You may have a, of course, a thorough analysis. You need also to conduct some interviews and surveys. Knowing what your learners stand regarding your subject help you know how much or how little you need to teach them. And it's important for us educators or teachers to know our students well, to create a well-balanced and much structured instruction. The step four is creating a learning objectives. 
Learning objectives are what students should be able to do when instruction is completed. They are usually in the form of knowledge, um, the skills, and of course, the attitudes. And these are the domains of learning. We have the cognitive for knowledge, psychomotor for the skills, and the affective domain for the attitudes or the, or the uh, beliefs. Learning objectives define learning outcomes and focus teaching. They help teachers to clarify, organize, and prioritize learning. And these learning objectives help you and your students evaluate progress and encourage them, of course, to take um, responsibility for their learning. But how do you write learning objectives? As part of the planning, you need to decide what your students need to be able to do after they have learned something that you have taught. Beginning your planning with the learning objectives will also help you to ensure that your tasks and activities are appropriate and will help you to or your students achieve their objectives. A good learning objective is to fill in the following sentence. At the end of the lesson, the students will be able to blank. This is another time when we have to be specific and use a strong verbs that specifically defines the student performance. Also, the learning objective should be SMART. What is SMART? S for specific, M for measurable, A for attainable, R for relevant, and T for time frame. Specific, it says exactly what the learner will be able to do. And learning objectives should be measurable and it can, can be observed by the end of the lesson. It must be, of course, attainable for the participants within a scheduled time. And it should be also relevant. Relevant to the needs of the learners and time-framed. And it, sh it should be achievable by the end of the lesson. A learning objective must not include the phrases to understand, um, to know, to learn, or to appreciate, or to appreciate. Um, the acronym for that is UKLA or the UCLA. So you, you must uh, avoid those verb or phrases. Again, to understand, to know, to learn, and to appreciate. Because these verbs are difficult to measure objectively. Because it is answerable either by yes or no. Understand, know, learn, and appreciate. Do not, uh, do not specify any overt doing. And although knowing and understanding underpin learning, objectives are always written using the active doing uh, verbs. They are statements of what you want your learners to do and should. For your own understanding, these are the following list and tables that contain examples of active verbs which describe the sorts of things you want your students to be able to do and may help you to write useful learning objectives. So that is the basic overview of the analysis phase of the ADI model. Next, we are going to talk about the design phase. Let's take a closer look at the second phase, the design phase. This is where you take all the learnings of the previous phase and use it to make practical decisions. And during the design phase, the teachers design assessments, choose a course format, and create an instructional strategy. The design phase involves, of course, using the outputs from the analysis phase to plan a strategy for developing the instruction. During this phase, you must outline how to reach the instructional goals determined during the analysis phase and expand the instruction or expand the instructional foundation. Some of the elements of the design phase may include writing a target population or target description, conducting a learning analysis, um, writing uh, objectives and test items, um, as well as uh, selecting a delivery system and sequencing the instruction. And the outputs of the design phase will be the inputs for the development phase. 
Next phase is the development phase. The development phase builds on both the analysis and the design phases. The purpose of this phase is to generate the lesson plans and the lesson materials. And during this phase, you will develop um, the instruction, um, all the media that you will be used in the instruction, and any supporting documentation. This may include the hardware, especially the, the, the equipment or the softwares, um, the computer-based instruction, your, the computer, the laptops, and so on and so forth. And during the development phase, the teachers or the educators create a sample, develop the actual course materials, and conduct a run-through. After going through analysis and design phases, you want to create a sample of your instruction. This may consist of the portion of the plan including some of your important parts um, and the instructional strategy you develop during the design phase. After creating your sample instruction or plan, it is time um, to dig in and develop the course materials. You should have already decided which instructional activities to include during the design phase when you made your instructional strategy. Now, once you have created your course materials, it will be time to conduct a run-through of your instruction. This is a real-time rehearsal of your lesson using all the materials and media you have created. You may also practice your instruction with other people or with the people around you at home. And of course, you need, um, you need to treat your, your brothers or your sisters or even your, your parents as if they were the actual students. And it is a good idea to prepare a feedback assessment after or ahead of time as well as to find out if there are many areas or any, any areas you can improve on. So that's the basic overview of the development phase of the ADI model. If you've done a thorough analysis and design, the development phase will go a lot smoother through, um, or though it still takes time to create uh, quality instructional materials. Next, we'll take a closer look at the implementation stage or implementation phase. The implementation phase refers to the actual delivery of instruction, whether it's a classroom-based, uh, a lab-based, or a computer-based instruction. The purpose of this implementation phase is to effective uh, or the effective and efficient delivery of instruction. Also in this space, um, preparing the learners and arranging the learning space are very important. It is essential to prepare the learners, of course, and make sure that they have the tools and knowledge necessary to participate in the class. And this space must promote the student's understanding of materials and, of course, to support the student's mastery of the objectives and ensure that um, students' transfer of knowledge from the instructional setting to the job. The last space in the ADI model is the evaluation phase. This space measures the effectiveness and efficiency of the instruction. Evaluation should actually occur throughout the entire instructional design process with paces between the paces and either um, it, and after the implementation. Evaluation may also be formative or summative. Formative assessment or formative evaluation is used to monitor students learning to provide ongoing feedback that can be used by instructors or the teachers to improve their teaching and uh, by students to improve their learning. And of course, the formative assessment or formative evaluation considers uh, evaluation as a process. This way, the student can see uh, student grow. With formative evaluation, teachers are trying to figure out whether a student's doing well or needs help by monitoring the learning process. Again, class, Formative assessment is the evaluation as a process. On the other hand, summative assessment, however, it's used to evaluate student learning at the end of the instructional unit. A summative assessment or a summative evaluation um, takes place it, uh, at a complete other time, meaning not during the process but after it. The evaluation takes place after a course or unit's completion. Again, assessment 
or the summative assessment is more on a product. A while ago, formative assessment is more on a process. Now, the summative assessment or summative evaluation is more on the product. Examples of a formative evaluation are the recitation or a simple questions and answer during the delivery of instruction or the lesson or during the discussion. While summative evaluation are the midterm exams or the end of unit or the chapter test or the final projects or different papers. So that's it for a basic overview of the evaluation phase of the ADI model. Conducting formative evaluation during each stage of the ADI process as well as administering a summative assessment or summative evaluation after the course implemented will help you to make sure that your lessons reach your instructional goals. Again, thanks for watching. I am Dr. Kenneth Samonte and see you again on the next session of K-Explained.